Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, uh, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event, uh, webinar, webcast, online show, whatever. Uh, <laughs> we, um, whatever you call us, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. However, if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and you can always go to our website and see all of our previous recordings there. And I'll show you where that is um, at the end of today's show. We post the recordings there, um, any presentations, like in this case PowerPoint presentations that are available, that are used during the show, and um, any handouts that might be included. Um, I also put links to any websites that might be mentioned. We have a delicious account to collect all of that. So all of that will be available to you afterwards. Um, in the recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your friends, uh, colleagues, neighbors, family, anyone. Great. <laughs> yeah, Wonderful. anyone who you think might be interested in any of our topics, uh, send them to our website and they can watch any of our live shows or all of our recordings. Um, we do a mixture of things here, uh, book reviews as we have today. Interviews, mini great. training sessions, demos of new services and products. Um, basically, the only criteria for our show is that it be um, something for libraries. Um, either something libraries are actually doing out there, uh, some new service or product available to libraries, something new out of the box they might not have been thinking about, but it's all library related. It all comes back to libraries in one way or another. Uh, we do bring in guest speakers to um, to the show sometimes, but we also have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff do shows. Um, and today, well, we were supposed to have a mixture today. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> um, right next to me right now is Sally Snyder, who is our uh, at, here at the Library Commission, uh, coordinator of Children and Young Adult Library Service. And um, with us, it was supposed to be joining us for today's topic, um, Jill Annis, who's from Elkhorn Middle, uh, Grandview Middle School, but um, she was unable to join us today. Um, health issues, but yes. um, that's okay. Sally is going to play the part of both herself and Jill today. <laughs> so I'll be reading Jill's descriptions mm -hmm. and trying not to stumble over words. I read through it this morning, so I'd be a little more familiar. Yeah. And so um, I didn't bring a hat to put on to Jill, <laughs> but um, you'll probably recognize the difference in um, phraseology mm -hmm. between the two of us. Yeah, and she'll try and say, you know, this was Jill's, this one was mine. Yeah, Jill whatever. says yeah. something like that. Um, so, and our topic for today, as you can see, is Best New Teen Books of 2016. And you can see from the slides here, um, this is actually a session that was that is done every year, um, both the teen version and a children's one that Sally does at our Nebraska Library Association and Nebraska School Librarian Association annual conference. And um, after that, I always have her come on the show and redo it for anyone who couldn't make it. To the conference and usually last year Jill did join us as well yes so that is our usual thing but just not this year <laughs> it didn't happen this year um, and I don't want you to take lots of notes because you can right. get the handout so just jot down something that will mm -hmm. remind you what title you were interested in do you want to show where those are first or at the I end? was thinking yes but we don't have we're not set up for that oh we can um, okay just a quick easy. yeah here's here. how to find them go to type in oh, NLC and it should go right to the website. Oops, there, there we go. go. When you're on our main website over here in the search area, just type handouts. And there it is. And the first one, Nebraska Library Commission handouts. I keep telling other people, you can put your handouts here, but <laughs> I'm the only one, so it just just my handouts. And you can see there under the 2016 NLA and SLA conference handouts is the best new teen books of 2016 PDF and right below that says with blurbs it's coming <laughs> <laughs> right next year <laughs> I hopefully in January and also the children's books with blurbs will happen it's just a matter of mm. merging two files and tidying up mm. so right now if you wanted to and anyone who did pre-register I did send you the link to this page um, yesterday afternoon to let you know if you wanted the list at least ahead of time okay. you can get that from here right now Right. And then soon there will be the blurb version as well. Thank you. All right. So, get back so to this. we'll just get started. A couple of uh, things to kind of give some background is a lot of these books are ones that 
we receive here at the Library Commission as review books from different publishers. Not any publisher, no publisher sends me every single book in the children's and teen range that they publish. Thank goodness I would be drowning. But I, I'm always missing something, but that's, you know, part of uh, working with books. Um, some of them are books that uh, Jill has run across. Mm. And some of them are ones we find at the public library or occasionally I buy it at the bookstore because I want to talk about that book. So they come from different places like that. And so if your favorite book isn't mentioned, it doesn't mean I hated it or anything. It just means <laughs> probably I didn't run across it in time for the presentation. Also, we, we do a very general age grouping, fiction for younger teens, fiction for older teens. So we leave that up to your discretion. We try to say how old the character is in the book mm -hmm. or what grade they're in in school so you get a sense of what group would likely read that book. But I don't want to narrow anybody's reading mm -hmm. because of an age of a kid in the book. So um, the blurbs are written by Jill. Her blurbs are. My blurbs are written by me. I have a couple of things I pulled off of novel list um, just because I had to quickly bring something together. So we'll get going with fiction for younger teens. And if you have questions like um, Krista said, or you just want to say, hey, my kids love that book, mm -hmm. go right ahead and type that in because it's fun to hear people who have teens reading. It's good to hear mm -hmm. that they really love it. Yeah. Jill says, Nick, 12, has an extraordinary vocabulary due to his linguistics professor father who pushes him to read and learn words from the dictionary that he has published. Nick doesn't enjoy the vocabulary lessons and would rather spend his time playing soccer with his best friend, Kobe. Nick's world begins to crumble when his mother decides to move out of state for a job and his appendix ruptures at a big soccer game right before regionals. Nick latches on to the eccentric librarian who helps him through his many middle school trials. With themes of divorce, bullying, and acceptance, the author of The Crossover has written another exceptional sports first novel. Fuzzy, Maxine, Max, is in sixth grade in middle school, and she happens across the newest student on his first day. Fuzzy, the first robot program to learn and to integrate the middle school. Lunch ladies, custodians, even the vice principal are computer robots, but Fuzzy is something else. Soon as it is clear that something is amiss at the school, and vice principal Barbara seems to have it in for Max and Fuzzy. Hmm. And again, look at the author, Tom Engelberger and Paul Deliner. Um, yeah, it'll be good. <laughs> Jill says, my life with the liars, Xilin, 12, has lived her entire life on a religious compound making good choices so she can stay in the light. She has been taught that everyone who lives on the outside is in the darkness and all are liars. One night her life changes when a strange man who calls himself her father takes her away from the compound to live with him and his family. On the outside there are no hungry days and many different clothes to choose from but Xilin still believes it is all lies. Her goal is to return to her home before her 13th birthday, where she will receive a special ceremony. This novel opens the reader's eyes to what life in a cult could look like and how children are the ultimate victims of brainwash. Mm. The Siren, Jill says, after a shipwreck kills Kaylin's family, she begs the sea to save her life. In repayment, Kaylin must serve 100 years as a siren of the sea, her voice sending innocent lives to their death in order to feed the ocean. After serving 80 years, Kaylin still grieves the loss of life. The ocean loves and cares for Kaylin as a mother would a daughter, but when Kaylin falls in love with a human named Akinley, it is strictly against the rules and she must hide it from the ocean and her siren sisters. Sirens are unable to speak, age, or marry. Is their courtship doomed? Will Kaylin find a way around the strict siren rules or will she and Akinley die trying? Hmm. Jill says Cedar, 12, has just lost her father and brother Ben in a devastating car accident. This is her first summer grieving their loss. Cedar, her mother, and younger brother Miles decide to spend the summer in Iron Creek. On her first day, Cedar meets neighbor Leo all dressed up in a theater costume. They become instant friends and Leo convinces Cedar to get a summer job at the Summer Lost Festival. Mysteries begin to fill Cedar's days. 
Who is placing objects on her window that reminds her of Ben? What happened to the ring of the late summer lost actress? Middle school novel filled with themes of new friendship, family, and learning to live with loss. The audio book was a great summer read, she said. Ah, nice. Brock Ripley, 14, has a passion for soccer, but he has tensed up as a goalie in big games. After the season ends, he is noticed at a local park by a high school quarterback star, Hunter Gates. He runs past plays to help Hunter practice for the upcoming season. When Brock becomes a successful receiver, Hunter and his father convince him to try out for the football team. After freezing in middle school soccer playoffs, Brock doesn't want to be labeled gutless in football. When Brock befriends a new student, Richie Fong, he begins to see how Hunter and the other football players are bullying Richie. Brock, does, Brock wants to stand up for his friend, but he doesn't want to lose their respect on the field. With short chapters and plot twists, I highly recommend this coming-of-age novel that helps to teach students to stand up for what is right, no matter what the outcome. <clears throat> Ramey Clark, 10, has come to realize the only way to get her father back is to win the 1975 Little Miss Central Florida contest. Her father left town two days ago with a dental hygienist, and he will see Ramey's picture in the paper, and he will have to come home to congratulate her. <laughs> in order to win the contest, Ramey needs to do good deeds and learn how to twirl a baton. She enrolls herself in a baton class with Louisiana Elefante, who has a show business background, and the headstrong Beverly Tapinski, who wants to sabotage the contest. As the competition approaches, an unexpected friendship arises between the three girls, a novel of love, loss, and the struggles of growing up in a small town. A very good middle school read. Mm -hmm. Whoops, I turned my page too soon, sorry. <laughs> this is a new series by John Flanagan called Ranger's Apprentice, The Early Years. And this is book one, the tournament at Orland. Halt's beginning years as a ranger starts with him working with Crowley to find a way to reunite the old school ranger corps who have been systematically fired by Mulgarath, Baron of Gorland, and replaced by toadies. The Baron is holding the king for safety in his castle, and it looks like Prince Duncan is ransacking the northern part of the country for his own enjoyment. Halt, Crowley, and some other true rangers look into the situation and are determined to right any wrongs, no matter the cost. This is sure to be popular because it's a look at earlier times of the very popular character of Halt. Yeah, lots of people like to see that kind of how do they get where they're at in the books I've already been reading. But. Yes. Well, I sure enjoyed it. <laughs> Jill says, Anna, 13, believes her life is falling apart. Her best friend, Danny, wants nothing to do with her as they begin eighth grade. Anna's mother has attempted suicide and is now in a treatment facility. Since her mother is in the hospital, Anna must live with her father, stepmother Marnie, and their new baby. Anna sits at the outcast table at lunch and is trying to find her place at school and at home without her mother. Once she realizes her stepmother can be helpful, things start to look up for Anna. Perfectly narrated by a typical sarcastic teenager who is adapting to the life she is given. Readers will enjoy seeing Anna grow through adversity and learning that life isn't always perfect. I was looking to you to change the screen. <laughs> Lily and Duncan, told in dual perspectives, perspectives of Tim, 13, and Norbert, 13. Both Tim and Norbert have secrets that only their family members know. Tim was born a boy, but he knows deep down that he is really a girl named Lily. Tim has been to the doctor to discuss the stru struggles of being transgender and the steps he needs to take before puberty hits. Norbert is just moving to Florida after a tragedy with his bipolar father, and he must live with his mom and grandmother until his mom gets back on her feet again. Norbert doesn't like his name or the fact that he has bipolar disorder either. Tim befriends Norbert and nicknames him Duncan for his love of Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Once school starts, the basketball team notices Norbert's height and wants him to try out for the team. Norbert makes the team and must decide if he and Tim can stay friends as Tim is being bullied by the athletes. Will Duncan stand up to his basketball teammates and will he learn to manage his bipolar medicine? Will Lily have the strength to make it through the next <clears throat> difficult steps in her journey? With two difficult topics to weave together into a novel, Gephardt handles both situations in a sensitive and thought-provoking manner. Get a drink here. Ah, Mr. Limoncello. 
<laughs> this is a, a sequel to Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library. In this book, Kyle Keeley, who is 13, and his teammates have become famous for escaping from Mr. Lemoncello's Library and completing the first library game. But children from all over the country demand their chance to play. Teams from different states must qualify to enter a new competition called the Library Olympics that will encompass research, library challenges, and tricky puzzles to solve. However, when library books turn up missing during the games, it threatens the entire Library Olympic competition, and the competitors now have another mystery to solve. Will Kyle and his team become the grand champions once again, or will the prestigious library be forced to close for good? Grabenstein definitely has a love for libraries, as this novel teaches readers about the Dewey Decimal System, the banning of books, and to view the library as a community center. It's a great sequel that is action-packed with many plot twists. On kind of a different note, <clears throat> this is a new series called Dream Jumper. The, this is the first book titled Nightmare Escape. <clears throat> ben has the ability to jump into other people's dreams which can be fun and can be terrifying. When his friends start falling victim to an evil monster in their dreams, Ben must harness the power within him to defeat the monster and save both strangers and his friends. And, oops. and that one, go back I, to that I, one. I jumped, sorry. I'm going the wrong way. Wait, where was I? Uh, try doing the, if you want to go back, do this one. Oh, that one. Yeah. There, there we go, go. sorry. Um. I, I just it caught my eye that it says a great ride as as a you know by J J Abrams, oh yeah, the director Greg Grunberg, one of the authors of this, is an actor. He was in Heroes, the TV show Heroes, oh, and various okay. other things. You recognize this book? You think I here. know that because I read this book? Well, <laughs> no, the J J Abrams had caught my attention. Yeah. I'm like, really? And then I saw the author. And I was like, hey, yeah, <laughs> makes sense now. And I didn't catch that at all. I was pushing <laughs> buttons, the wrong buttons. Okay, moving on to To Catch a Cheat. This is a sequel to The Great Green Heist, which was a wonderful book. In this one, Jackson Green, in eighth grade, has again promised no more schemes or pranks, and he's stuck with it. He is surprised when the principal calls him into his office and accuses him and Charlie, his best friend, of flooding the school over the weekend. There is even video evidence that they did it, but they did not do it. Now they need to discover who doctored the video and what can be done about it. And these are fun because Jackson Green is kind of like an Ocean's 12, Ocean's 11. Oh, he cool. can come up with these mm -hmm. elaborate schemes, and he keeps promising not to do it anymore. But this time, they have to save their names. So I guess it's okay. <laughs> Friend or Foe is part of the Unbarred series. This one is a modern retelling of Shakespeare's Othello. In this one, Ian is hurt when Orlando, their band's leader, chooses Chase over him to keep the band going while our Orlando is in jail. Slowly, with lots of con conniving and murder, everything falls apart. Other books in the series include Duty or Desire, about Anthony and Cle a, a modernization of Anthony and Cleopatra, Harder Mind, and modernization of Romeo and Juliet, mm -hmm. and Fight or Flee, Hamlet. Huh? Now we get to Terror of Bottle Creek. Court, 13, and his father are preparing for the oncoming hurricane. They live in Alabama on a houseboat docked on a friend's property. Mrs. Stovall has two daughters, Liza, 13, and Francie, 6. As the hurricane begins to blow, Court's dog, Catfish, drags Francie back to the houseboat, and Court and Liza follow. Soon, all are trapped as the houseboat pulls free of the moorings and tosses along the river in the hurricane. When the houseboat falls apart, it is up to Court to find higher ground for the three of them to survive since he knows the swamp almost as well as his father does. The problem with this is that all kinds of animals are also seeking higher ground. This is a Golden mm -hmm. Sower nominee for 2017-2018. Oh, nice. So local. Yeah. Oh, Nebraska. Yes. Good point. Mm -hmm. Book two in the Masterminds um, series. In book one, teens Malik, Eli, Tori, and Amber just discovered that their town of Serenity, New Mexico, it's an enormous science experiment testing the effects of cloning master criminals. After finding out that their town isn't perfect and that they are, in fact, the test subjects, the teens break free of the town and their families. Now, in book two, they must dig deep into their inner criminal in order to survive and steer, steer clear of the scientists who are out to find them. The problem is they don't know how to survive in the outside world, and they must figure out a way to expose their captors and save other clones. 
more problems and new enemies arise in this fast-paced science fiction <clears throat> sequel to Masterminds. And readers will be begging for the third installment that comes out in March of 2017. And it's Gordon Cormick. So. Some authors who just know. Yeah, the, better, the regular, yeah. the usual suspects. <laughs> right. This is a full-color graphic novel, the first in a new series titled Four Points. It is 1860. Twins Alex and Cleopatra, called Cleo, are 12, and they are on their own while their father has been gone for months looking for work. Soon they are traveling, too, looking for their father. And they may go to San Francisco to answer an ad for $200 from a man man looking for his 12-year-old red-headed grandsons. Edwin and Science, Silas, also red-haired twins and a bit older, have the same plan. It isn't long before one of each set of twins is shanghaied onto a ship sailing around Cape Horn. The other two get together and hide on another ship sailing to the Isthmus of Panama. They plan to hide on the train across and sail up to San Francisco, but fate intervenes. Chris, 12, his Uncle Jack takes him from Vancouver to Alaska to sail on his boat. Chris is surprised to see another boy on the boat, Frank, who's 16. It has been about a year since Chris's father died, and Chris still has terrible dreams at night. The sailboat hits something in the night, and soon Chris, soon Chris and Frank are in the dinghy, but Uncle Jack is gone. They finally reach land and are stranded in the wilderness with nothing until they find an abandoned cabin. Survival, finding a way to work together when they hate each other, and hoping for rescue when there is no way to let anyone know they need help. Oh, and a grizzly bear has wandered through their fishing area a couple of times, too. Of course. So they've got some <laughs> stuff to handle. Rise of the Wolf is book two in the Mark of the Thief series. In this book, Nick, who has been a slave for five years in ancient Rome, is determined to stay away from his newly discovered grandfather, General Randolph. The Praetors believe Nick has the key to another amulet, the Malice of Mars, and they want him to retrieve it for them. They are holding his mother hostage for it. Nick is not sure who he can trust besides his friends Aurelia and Crispus and his sister Livia. Trading as a charioteer prepares him for the challenge from the Praetors when the first race of the Lude Romani games in honor of the Emperor. Lots of intrigue and danger. And book three will come out at the end of January next year. It's titled Wrath of the Storm. Jill says, Jackie Hart, 12, has made a vow to lose her class clown reputation this year in seventh grade. But no matter how hard she tries, Jackie can't keep her mouth shut. She receives five, de five detentions on the first day of school and 20 by the end of the week. Jackie has a stuttering habit that she is self-conscious about, and the principal will only drop the detentions if Jackie enters this public speaking competition and tries out for the school play. Although she dreads both activities, these struggles help her as a student and an individual. It's a good, good middle school read for fans of middle school, the worst years of my life, with a female protagonist. This is a graphic novel, as it says there on the cover. Set in the Depression, Samantha White, called Stowe by her mother, returns home from boarding school after her father dies. His second wife, who appears to have some magic, is dismayed to find he has left her only a trust fund and everything else to her his daughter. The ticker tape of the stock market stands in for the mirror, and seven rugged boys from the alleys stands in for the dwarves. Beautifully mm -hmm. told in black, gray, and white art with a minimum mm -hmm. of text. Really lovely. Interesting. Yeah. Zen Starling is a petty thief to help support his mother and sister and loves to ride the trains that travel in minutes through a gateway to other solar systems. This futuristic story shows Zen pretending to be a lesser-known member of a wealthy family, but it backfires and he ends up on the run. Um, Kirkus says there's at least one sequel coming, but I haven't seen any um, information about mm -hmm. what it might be, when it might come, and what its title might be. Love this book. <laughs> this is book one in a propo proposed four-book series. The series is called Track. Castle Crenshaw, call me Ghost, in seventh grade has been fast ever since he and his mom ran away from his father, who was threatening them with a gun. Ghost is often on the edge of trouble, but really doesn't want any, and he doesn't want to upset his mom. One day he watches a track team practicing and stands up and raises the runner he thinks is too smug. Coach offers him a chance to try out and be on the team, but he has to keep up his schoolwork and stay out of trouble. He tries, but it is hard for him. Coach knows where Ghost is coming from and has been coaching for years to help kids stay out of trouble. 
And I'm excited that this is a, a series about track because mm -hmm. um, we have football and basketball books mm -hmm. a lot, which are great, yeah. but other aspects of sports as well. And a lot too. of other sports, yeah. Mm -hmm. Baseball, a lot of baseball books. A lot of baseball, too. that's true. Yeah. The Secret Language of Sisters. Tilly, 14, and Rue, 16, have always had a connection. Tilly is impatient and always moving. Rue is calm and together. When Tilly impatiently texts Rue again and again to pick her up, Rue breaks a, a rule and texts a brief reply while driving and ends up in a crash. Now Rue has locked-in syndrome where she knows what's going on, but she cannot communicate with anybody. And no one knows that that's her condition. And that is just the beginning. Chapters alternate between the sister's viewpoints. Her sister does figure it out, and Rue can move one eyelid, just one. And that's how she communicates. Good family story, though some reviews say the texting and driving message is a little heavy-handed. I didn't think it was was so much, but Rick Riordan again. Um, how can you go wrong? But this is the first book in the Trials of Apollo new series. It's titled The Hidden Oracle. Apollo was sent to Earth as a 16-year-old boy with missing memories because Zeus blames him for the war with Gaia. Now he has none of his former powers and apparently must complete a mission before he will be restored. Percy Jackson helps him and his new friend Meg get to Camp Half-Blood, but he has his own problems, too. He's only in the story limit in limited amount. There is plenty of trouble to go around. Demigods have been disappearing. The Oracle of Delphi has been cut off, and there seems to be a conspiracy working to destroy the status quo. It's humorous. Apollo often rants about how wonderful he usually is, and now he must face danger with none of his powers. Oh, yes, Rick's been very busy. <laughs> because yeah. this is the, first, uh, the second book, excuse me, in the Gods of Asgard series. Magnus, Chase, and his friends must find Thor's missing hammer before the giants decide to attack our world. And Loki is up mm. to something. Of course. Too. Interest will still be high for this mythic series by Riordan. For both of them, actually. Mm. <laughs> um, Jill says, 8th grader Max Crumley is experiencing public school for the very first time. He was glad to get out of homeschooling with Grandma, but public school has been one humiliation after another. Max throws up on the school bully. He lost a race due to needing to go to the bathroom and has been locked in his locker twice so far. Max is documenting his journey in an illustrated journal of his middle school ups and downs. Will Max be able to get out of his locked locker or will he be stuck there the entire weekend? What other trouble can Max get into? Will he be forced back to homeschooling with Grandma? It's a new series by the Dork Diaries author, author that will be sure to attract the Diary of a Whippy Kid fans. I said it did look similar. Yeah, had the does, same, yeah. yeah, same art style. Yeah. This is a heartbreaker. Oh. Um, Jack, 12, this is from novelist, I'm quoting, tells the gripping story of Joseph, 14, who joins his family as a foster child. Damaged in prison, Joseph wants nothing more than to find his baby daughter, Jude, Jupiter, whom he has never seen. When Joseph has begun to believe that he'll have a future, he is confronted by demons from his past, that force a tragic sacrifice. Gary Schmidt is an excellent author, and this is another outstanding title. Astrid Sullivan, 17, lives in Detroit, where the latest thing is racing horses called Titans, which are actually machines. Her family has fallen on hard times, and she jumps at the chance to ride a Titan in the race circuit this summer with the hope of being able to save her family's home. Racing is dangerous, and the other jockeys see her as an intruder in their domain. And is her horse, Padlock, really responding to her with affection and emotion, or is she just imagining it? Appealing hard luck story with a tough heroine and her supportive crew. The last place on earth, Jill says, Daisy Cruz, 16, is worried about her best friend, Henry Hawking, because she hasn't heard from him in days. Daisy believes an awkward moment they shared has ruined their friendship. When days pass without any contact from Henry, Daisy knows it has to be more. Plus, many students and staff at school are suddenly becoming sick. She finds a note on Henry's desk and believes he is in danger. She follows the clues to Los Padres National Forest and finds an underground bunker. Davy is thrust into a potential apocalypse that she is not well equipped to handle. Can Daisy become a survivalist, or is this all just a bad dream? 
themes of friendship, loyalty, and family are depicting in this engaging mystery. Another uh, graphic novel by Rena Telgemeier. Katrina and her family have moved to the coast of Northern California for the sake of her little sister, Maya, who has cystic fibrosis. And Kat is even less happy about the move when she is told that her new home is haunted while Maya sets her heart on meeting a ghost. Maya is curious about death as hers appears more imminent than other children's. And she is also interested in the Day of the Dead celebration as a part of her own history. Her mother is from Mexico. Their father is white. And mm -hmm. Katrina is scared of any thought of ghosts. <laughs> so the older sister scared the younger sister. Thank you. Yeah. Some nonfiction for teens. This is a history of modern forensic science. And the author starts for, with the first test for arsenic poisoning that happened in the 1800s and then moves forward through criminal profiling and fingerprinting and, and where those started, as far as we know, and how they've been used in determining the, the dastardly deeds. And mm -hmm. by the time I got done reading this book, I thought everybody wants to kill everybody. <laughs> but it's very well done and good information, and teens will be fascinated mm -hmm. by the topic. There's a lot of TV shows that are about that now, yeah, too, on true, some yeah. of the cable channels, yeah. Good point. This is the third book in the Deadly Diseases trilogy. The first one was Red Madness, and the second one was Fatal Fever about Typhoid Mary. In this title, she briefly hits on previous bubonic plague pandemics, but focuses mostly on the one that hit the U.S. in the early 1900s, having started up again first in China, then Hong Kong, India, and beyond. Excellent research told with plenty of photos and illustrations from the time. And you'll be depressed to know that, yes, bubonic plague is still here. <laughs> I mean, it still here. exists. Yeah. It still exists in the U.S., mm -hmm. in, um, mostly in animals, not people. Scientists in the Field series, Ooh, sharks. this is about the great white shark. And the author noted that while he was researching for this book, he only saw calm sharks, none of the frenzy that the <laughs> movies have focused on. So he was rather impressed with these mm -hmm. sharks. And the book follows Dr. Greg Skomal, who is a biologist and head of the Massachusetts Shark Research Program. And he's working to understand the habits and, and behavior of the great white shark to give us more information about it. And how can, how can you be, go wrong with this book on your shelf? Yeah. Um, I thought it was Shark Week. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. Um, this is from Novelist because I couldn't get a hold of Jill's blurb. It's the story of the landmark 1944 surgical procedure that repaired the heart of a child with blue baby syndrome, lack of blood oxygen caused by a congenital defect. The team that developed the procedure included a cardiologist and a surgeon, but most of the actual work was done by Vivian Thomas, an African-American lab assistant who was frequently mistaken for a janitor in the 40s. And he was initially left out of the recognition and acclaim. Of course. Dr. Blaylock's research, he was Dr. Blaylock's research assistant who had lost his savings for medical school in the 1929 stock market crash. Mm. And in the children's book list, we have, I read a title called Tiny Stitches, which is actually about this same discovery and, uh, and about um, Vivian Thomas. So you might look for that title as well. Mm -hmm. In this book, each chapter discusses the author's visit to one of the many areas of a zoo. She goes behind the scenes with the keepers and shares much of what is involved in caring for the animals and the, some of their quirky behaviors. Excellent photos will draw in the readers. Well, if you're interested in animals, because I grabbed this book off the shelf and ran with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good topic for me. Jill says, this volume of the Scientists in the Field series takes readers to New Caledonia, a French island in the Pacific. This island is the home to a species of remarkably bright birds, bright crows. All crows have a lot of intelligence, but the New Caledonian crows are able to make and use tools. Turner tracks a team of scientists who observe the crows in the lab and in the wild, tracking their problem-solving skills and social behavior. Colorful pictures throughout with detailed scientific observations comparing crows with other species and concluding with an Ask the Author session, section. It's another great volume to add to the nonfiction section. Some fiction for older readers. Jill says, Celestine, 17, lives in a dystopian society where everyone is required to be perfect, so I'm out of luck. <laughs> yeah. Just forget it. Those who fail to show perfection are branded with the letter F and are considered flawed. 
Flawed citizens are to live by strict laws and are bullied and ostracized by the public. Her entire life, Celestine has been a rule follower and overachiever until one day she aids an elderly, flawed man on the city bus while everyone looks at her in disbelief. That one decision completely changes her entire life. Will Celestine be considered flawed and be branded? Action-packed novel that has the reader contemplating human nature and the cliffhanger ending will make you want to read the sequel, Perfect, that comes out in April next year. Yeah. Sammy, 18, is a determined high school senior with her whole life ahead of her, winning the debate championship to, gradu to graduate top of her class and head to New York for college. Then comes the worst diagnosis of her life. Sammy has a genetic condition that will rob her mind and deteriorate her muscles. The news is extremely hard to believe since Sammy has a photographic memory. Mm. Sammy wants her future self to remember her senior year in high school and the days that follow. She decides to write a memory book so she will be able to look back on when she can on it when she can no longer remember. As the weeks progress, the reality of her condition is brought to light. Will Sammy be able to compete in the debate finals? Which of her friends will stick by her side? With humor mixed with sadness, this genetic disorder is brought to life in journal entries by Sammy, her family, and friends. Highly recommended for fans of The Fault in Our Stars and 13 Reasons Why. Mm -hmm. Sounds very similar. Right. Yeah. Jill says, Bar Mayor Barrow, 17, has come a long way from living in the stilts. Mayor is a red with silver abilities to control electrical energy. A fierce battle has erupted against the silvers and the red rebellion led by Mayor with Cal by her side. Unable to fully trust anyone, Mayor's goal is to track down the other new bloods like herself in order to form an army capable of taking down King Maven, who is murdering these mutants in order to force Mayor back into his control. Mary's desire for revenge may lead her in the wrong direction, and at times she shows similarities to Queen Alara, whom Mary despises. Hmm. Will Mary be able to locate the new bloods before King Maven, or will she let her desire for re revenge ruin everything? Fast-paced sequel to Red Queen. The cliffhanger ending will have fans anxiously awaiting the third installment titled King's Cage, which hits the bookstores in February of next year. Not too much longer now, do we? No. 17-year-old Poppy stumbles into a secret workshop at the infamous Grossholz Candle Factory in her hometown, and soon a wax boy called Dud is helping her uncover an evil plot that threatens her hometown of Paraffin, Vermont. He can walk and talk mm. and Interesting. Get, get, <laughs> get his arm or something bent and get it back straight again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, this author has an interesting imagination. I've yeah. enjoyed all of her books so far. They're not too scary for me, which is one thing. They're a little bit scary. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. This is the first book in a new series. In an alternate world, it is 1942 prior to Pearl Harbor, and the U.S. government has just allowed women to serve in the military on the front lines. It, this book follows four women who volunteer for service and after boot camp soon find out what war is. Two serve together in Africa, one hopes to be a medic, and the fourth is in intelligence. It is, as to be expected, gritty and tough, and includes both men supportive of women in combat and men who find it ridiculous. Yeah. I don't know how many books are going to be in this series, but there's certainly going to be more. Jill says, Nathan, 17, is a half-blood. His mother was a white witch, and his father was the most notorious black witch in history. Nathan is only seeking revenge and searching for his lost love, Annalise, who shot and killed his father. His only obsession is to locate and kill Annalise, which makes Nathan unable to assist the Alliance with restoring balance. In order for the war to end, Nathan must obtain the amulet, which will make him indestructible, and he needs to kill Walland and Sol O'Brien, the heads of the evil council of white witches. Now, can white witches have an evil council? <laughs> That's him. Gabriel holds a key to Nathan's heart and soul, but the consequences are devastating and beautiful. Nathan's life comes around full, full circle, and the conclusion is both thought-provoking and haunting in this finale to the Half-Blood trilogy. Mm. Again, Jill says, a graphic picture surfaces through social media of a drunk, topless, unconscious teenage girl during a high school party. The next day, four students are arrested for sexual assault. Small 10 mentality begins questioning the victim, blaming her, and taking the side of the athletes. Narrated by senior Kate Weston as she begins to question the, re the reactions of her friends and peers and the beginning of a new relationship with her neighbor and childhood friend Ben. 
The truth becomes clear when an obscure hidden video is found that night. It's found on the web. This book is a must-read for high school students and parents to bring awareness of the sad reality of sexual assault and to bring up the obligation of bystanders to speak the truth. This is a realistic fiction novel that has similarities to the Steubenville High School rape case in 2012. Mm. Jill says, Olivia, 17, has grown up believing her father murdered her mother in the woods when she was only three years old. Fourteen years and several foster homes later, new evidence proves that Olivia's father was also a victim that day. Olivia, now known as Ariel, decides to return to her father's hometown and attend the funeral. Once in Medford, she realizes she can't go on unless she figures out the truth and finds her parents' killer. Filled with suspense and page-turning action, readers will feel like they know Olivia and will root for her to uncover the 14-year mystery. The dedication of the book was touching, and you will love Nora even more knowing that she is like the author's mother. Mm -hmm. The reader will also figure out the significance of the book cover at the end of the novel. What a perfect touch to an amazing novel. Yeah. Jill says Hanukkah, 17, has just lost the love of her life in the war. She begins working at a funeral parlor in Nazi-occupied Holland to help her pick up the pieces and support her family. She also has an undercover job working in the black market smuggling hard-to-come-by cigarettes, meat, and other desirable items. <clears throat> One day, a customer asks for assistance finding a missing Jewish girl in a blue coat who she was hiding. Hanukkah can't believe what her neighbor is asking, but decides to uncover the clues to the mysterious disappearance of the 15-year-old girl, Mirjam. Hanukkah joins an underground resistance group, and together they begin to fit the pieces together of why the girl disappeared. Hess thoroughly researched this time and depicts themes of self-discovery, redemption, and social responsibility in this World War II novel. And this book depends of the boy in the striped pajamas and the boy who dared. Mira, 17, lives on a six-mile-long, half-mile-wide Haven Island near New Jersey. They can see the lights of Atlantic City at night mm -hmm. with mother and younger brother Jasper Lee, who has Hunter Syndrome. Best friends and classmates... Eva and Denny, old Carmen, Jillian Shift, whose name is really Johnny Carpenter. But here Hurricane Sandy hits the island and devastation is everywhere. What has happened to Mira's friends? Her mother and brother are on the mainland due to a doctor appointment. How can she let them know she's all right? Mm. It's, a, it's a kind of a shocking look at what devastation hurricanes can bring. It is 1906 in San Francisco and Mercy Wong, 15, daughter of a laundryman in Chinatown, has managed to bribe her way into attending St. Clair's School for Girls, pretending to be an heiress from China, to further her education and set herself up to go to college. Mm. The girls are not welcoming, and Mercy strives to maintain her disguise. Then one morning the earthquake hits, and soon Mercy is the one holding everyone together. She is worried about her family as she finds a way to feed not only the surviving St. Clair girls, but others now living in the park with them. Mercy is a kind, strong, let's get to it character who will appeal to many teen readers. Jill says Parker Grant, 17, was blinded in a car accident at the age of seven, which also took the life of her mother. Adapting to blindness, Parker has developed a set of rules for her friends and family. Rule number one states, don't deceive me, ever, especially using my blindness, especially in public. Unfortunately, Parker's former boyfriend, Scott, breaks this rule in middle school when he secretly invites his friends in a room with Parker without her knowledge. Parker was completely humiliated and has never forgiven him. Her world begins to crumble when her father suddenly passes away and Scott transfers to Verse High School. Will her love of running help to ease her pain or will joining the track team and finding a guide runner just add to the complications in her life? This unique novel grips the reader by showing how one character can overcome things and learn to live a different life without her parents. Mm -hmm. Harper, 17, and her best friend Kate have held up to the plan for their futures since sixth grade to become ballerinas, share an apartment in San Francisco, their home. Then things fall apart. Kate is on their way to her dream. Harper is not. Her body cannot do what Kate can do. With her dream lost, Harper finds a last-minute opportunity and goes to Antarctica to winter over for six months as a research assistant and to pat yourself up. Told in alternating chapters of Antarctica and San Francisco, the book slowly reveals what Harper should have seen coming and chose to ignore. Book list says, an adventure story with lots of heart. 
Is that one you, you had? I recognize that cover. Was that in the summer reading program list, maybe? Or I think I, I had this on a Friday read. Oh, okay. Our, That's what it was. Yes. Page. Okay. I think that was it. I recognize the cover. <laughs> Good remember. <laughs> This is a fictional account of the impact of the Great East Japan Earthquake and Tsunami, which occurred in March of 2011. Kai, 17, is in school when the earthquake hits, and soon everyone is running for higher ground. He ends up in an auditorium set up as a shelter for survivors, and he hopes his mother and grandparents are okay. He has more heartbreak to come. Told in free verse, the novel conveys the terror of the quake and tsunami hitting the land and of the hard situations that follow. Kai's American father had, had left the family and returned to the, new U to the U.S., and now he hopes to contact him. Excellent book and heartfelt telling of this tragic event. Jill says, Emily, 16, knows right from wrong, but even good people make mistakes. Emily was at a high school football game one night and saw Belinda, a classmate with developmental disabilities, being assaulted under the bleachers. Instead of assisting Belinda, Emily froze. Lucas, a football player, also did not aid Belinda but found a teacher instead. The consequences of their lack of action are, commu are community service at a center for young adults with disabilities. Luckily, Belinda was able to fend off the attacker herself and she begins trying to pick herself back up and move on. Emily and Lucas form a friendship and start to believe that they are helping at the community center. Can Emily and Lucas find a way to apologize and to help the person they hurt the most? Told in dual perspectives of en Emily and Belinda, the governs voice for the distinctive characters shines through and themes of regret, love, and forgiveness are portrayed. This is a paranormal book, actually. Um, a 17-year-old boy. I have to turn the page to find out. I thought I had his name. His family has, for years, done a, done a process that keeps the rocks from falling off the cliff and keeps everyone alive. Although, lately, as he's been maturing, he's wondered how those rocks, which are really kind of a little bit away from the town, could really affect the town. It's not like in this picture where it mm. actually would fall on the town. And what happens is he discovers that his family has a deep, dark secret and that the, the ritual to keep the rocks from falling is really more about um, keeping someone alive, his grandmother, mm. than anything else. And he has to decide if he's going to support his family or free the town from there. Potential tyranny. Mm. Part of this is done because he has the ability to pull things out of other people. And that, like, he can pull out your interest in kittens mm. and use that okay. to satisfy uh. the rocks. Mostly that doesn't cause any harm, but a couple of times it has made a difference. So it's an intriguing mm -hmm. premise. Idea, yeah, yeah. And what should he do? And I read that book. It sounds like I had didn't, but it's great. <laughs> it's all your fault. This one was great. Catlin Singleberry is 17 years old, and she is part of the, the family singing group. She's a proper Christian teenager. But she has now been asked to spend the weekend with her impossible cousin, Heller Harrigan, a Hollywood wild child, and keep her out of trouble for the weekend yeah. so they can go to the big movie debuts. And it's not easy. <laughs> and I just want to note that um, homeschooled is used regularly, and this is in New York, to explain Catlin's uncool clothing, viewpoints, opinions, attitudes, etc. Mm -hmm. Whenever somebody says, what? She's homeschooled, they say. Which mm -hmm. I found a little irritating, but it is a fun book. The Winner's Kiss is book three in the Winner's Trilogy. Jill says, Kestrel, 17, has been taken prisoner by her own people and forced to work in a barbaric work camp where she is drugged in order to work long hours under the watch of ruthless guards. Prisoners then long for the nighttime drug that is given for a restful night's sleep. Aaron does not know of Kestrel's predicament as he is preparing for war with Valoria. Aaron is unstoppable, and as he has gained a new alliance with Dakra, he also has the god of death on his side. Can Aaron fully trust this new alliance? Will Kestrel escape the work camp and will Aaron be able to forgive her? Action-packed finale in the Winner's Curse trilogy, the conclusion will have readers more than satisfied. Jill says, set in January of 1945, when Russian armies were advancing through East Prussia, four teenagers are clinging to the hope of escape. With much research of the tragic sinking of the German ship Wilhelm Kostloff, 
Septus writes in four alternating voices. Lithuanian nurse Joanna, Polish Himalia, Prussian forger Florian, and German soldier Alfred. In their desperate fight for escape, these four young people come from very different backgrounds and each has their own dark secret. The connection between the characters brings the novel to life and has readers hoping for their survival in this tragedy. It's a heartbreaking page turner in historical fiction novel that helps readers gain knowledge of a little known part of history and leaves them with a little bit of hope. Maisie, 16, is an excellent high school runner with plans of college scholarships. Dedicated to running, she wakes up early one morning for a jog when the weather turns ugly. Lightning strikes a tree, which brings down the power line. At first, Maisie believes it is fireworks she is seeing, but in reality, the power line causes an electrical fire to burn Maisie, nearly destroying her face. Eh? While in the burn unit, Maisie is able to receive a very rare partial face transplant surgery. Will Maisie's mm. surgery be a success, and will she able to be able to accept her new self and learn to live again? It's an excellent realistic fiction book for fans of The Running Dream, Artichoke's Heart, and Cold Hand's Warm Heart. Jill says Eden, 15, is a band geek freshman who has had a crush on her older brother's best friend, Kevin, for years, until one night her world was turned upside down. Kevin sneaks into Eden's room and sexually assaults her and threatens to kill her, if she speaks a word of it to anyone. Instead of seeking help from her family or friends, Eden keeps a secret and begins to turn into a completely different person, distancing herself from people and using boys to gain control over her body. Smith's debut, debut novel is broken down into four parts, Eden's freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior years of high school. Will Eden break her silence and let her friends and her family know of her attack? This difficult story of one rape survivor portrays the realization but each victim reacts differently and goes through their own painful journey on the road to recovery. This is a sequel to the book An Ember in the Ashes. The sequel to oh, this has Elias and Lyra on the run from Elias's mother, the evil commandant and new vicious emperor Marcus. The two are headed to Kalf prison where they are hoping to free Lyra's brother, who knows the secret of making Sarek steel. This knowledge might just save Laia's people, the scholars, from extinction by the Empire. Along the way, Elias is posed, poisoned and his strength is weakening. The journey becomes even more complicated when the rebel Keenan appears. This story is told from three points of view, Laia, Elias, and Helen, once Elias' close friend. Now Helene is the Brudge Reich, Elias' sworn enemy, who is commanded to capture him and Laia. With a bit of magic and some dark action-packed plot, the second installment proves to be extremely suspenseful, leaving a cliffhanger ending that will have readers craving the third book set to print in 2018. 18. That's just too long. Whoa, that's a long time, yeah. The Art of Being Normal. <clears throat> set in England, Leo is 15, is a new guy at Eden Park School, and he is keeping a low profile. Rumors are he attacked a teacher at his former school in a tough neighborhood, so students are keeping their distance. Mm. Everyone is intrigued, though, including David, 14, and his friends Felix and Essie. We know early on that David feels he is a girl but has been afraid to tell his parents. David's secrets and a secret Leo was hiding can only be kept for so long. Jill says, Outcast high school seniors Dill, Travis, and Lydia are best friends trying to survive their final year of school in small town Tennessee. Dill's preacher father has been sent to jail and Dill must help his mother with the bills. Travis is obsessed with a fantasy book series and keeps busy working at the lumber yard with his abusive father. Lydia is all into fashion and has a blog with thousands of followers. The three have very little in common besides not being in the popular group at school. Together their friendship binds them, but what will happen after graduation when Lydia goes off to college leaving Travis and Dill behind? Zentner presents themes of bullying, friendship, love, and loss, making this one of my favorite YA books so far this year. I haven't cried this much since I read all the bright places. Highly recommend it. <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing. Yes. <laughs> Obviously very well written then if it gets yeah. to you. Get to her so much. Yeah. Did get to her. Jill says Micah Carter, 18, is having difficulties remembering what happened the night his best friend and soulmate Janie's house burned down. Micah is continually questioned by therapists, police officers, and his friend Dewey, but his memory is foggy, a problem worsened by drinking. Janie and Micah have been inseparable, inseparable friends since elementary school when Janie moved in next door. Janie was the outgoing personality and Micah the shy introvert. The friendship was perfect as long as no one else finds out about it. 
the point of view switches between Janie's thoughts before the fire and Micah's afterwards. This unique writing style and the mystery behind the fire keeps the reader hooked, needing to know and find out what happened to Janie. And thank you. That's our list, and we did pretty well. With yeah, our time it's just eleven o'clock right now. Yeah, you yeah. thought you'd go long. I, <laughs> I just kept on reading. <laughs> we hope you found some titles that will work in your library. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we had any comments by anyone. Um, no, nothing came in. Anybody have any comments or questions or thoughts you want to share? Type it into the question section. Um, I thought it was interesting. It's, you, there's as you know, lots of series books, but. Uh, I started getting the, the feeling a lot are wrapping up, but new ones are starting. So yes. yeah, hopefully people are like, ah, my series is done. It's the last one. What do I do? It's okay. There's something new coming. There's something <laughs> new coming. And one of the fun things about um, writing a, a review or a book talk about these titles or reading them here is when you start saying it's the third book and, and it's the wrap up and you're saying, so and so mm -hmm. goes where and, and nobody if you haven't read the book like some of hers I haven't read mm -hmm. I don't know who any of those people are or where they were trying to go but I'm still intrigued yeah and now okay. you're like I need to go back now and start do that I really want to read now. three books <laughs> or yeah I do some of those it is hard to keep up with all of them yeah and, and it's tricky to write the description so that you can give the information without giving anything away right but also letting people know what's happening in that mm -hmm. book. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, I don't see anybody have anything urgent they want to say online, so that's cool. We'll wrap it up for this morning. It's ending practically on time. Thank you very much, yeah. Sally. Thank you, Jill. Even though you weren't here for you know, at least you know being able to share your blurbs. Yes. Thank I'm you. doing the legwork of reading all those books that Sally didn't <laughs> didn't get to. Um, it's a lot easier to read half the books than it is to read all of the books. <laughs> yeah. So where's my okay. Um, like no. All right. Oops. I'll just do it this way. There we go. Um, all right. So that will wrap it up for um, this week's show. Um, it will be on our website. If you just type and now on the commission's website, you can get to us by um, going there and typing in Encompass Live. Um, should come up. Yep. You can also just Google Encompass Live. We happen to be the only thing out there calling ourselves that oh, so yeah. far. Good for us. Hopefully that'll last. Um, this is our upcoming shows, but our archives will be right over here, um, right underneath our, our um, upcoming shows. And um, by this afternoon, probably today's show will be posted. It'll be here with the recording, the PowerPoint presentation, and I'll put a direct, direct link here also to that handouts page for you where the, the current list is and where the one with the blurbs will be. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Hope you join us next week when our topic is Begin with Books and Early Literacy Partnership. Um, Lincoln City Libraries has been working with the City County Health Department to provide books and, and information and things for getting kids started really early in reading to um, the low income clients that, they, that come through the Health Department. So um, Vicki Wood from Lincoln City Libraries will be with us next week to tell us about this program and how they got it to, how they pulled it off and what um, some information for you if you want to do the same thing in your library. So please do sign up for that episode and any of the other ones we have coming up here. Um, these are our first episodes of January 2017. Yay! New year, new shows. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, we are on uh, Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, you can pop over to our Facebook page, give us a like. You'll um, get announcements of when we've uh, recordings are available, when a new shoot, new shows coming up, um, reminders of sessions. So like here's when it says log in right now for today's show. So you can see that over there. So it definitely do um, like us over there if you're big on Facebook to keep up with what you're doing, what we're doing. <laughs> Other than that, that wraps it up for this week's show. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, we have something here. Somebody said something. I missed it. Ah, thanks. It says, thank you for hosting this. I enjoyed it. Look forward to recommending these books. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And thank you, Krista, for running the show every day. Oh, of course. For almost every day. <laughs> Once in a blue moon, I step in and yes. often have to stumble a little bit, but nah. I'm getting better. You're a good uh, <clears throat> fill-in host. Yeah, backup host. <laughs> All right, then that'll wrap it up for today. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.